Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good evening. Welcome to Artist Place Books and Talks. Thank you all for coming. Um, so this evening's event is the last of three conversations uh, that form the first season of a regular series organized with art historian Bettina Funk under the title Artist Space Dialogues. The idea for this series sprang from a public conversation between Bettina and filmmaker Laura Poitras held in January last year. And over the last three months, Bettina has held very insightful and engaging dialogues with art historian Douglas Crimp and artist Sarah Morris. Uh, the simple impetus behind this series is to concentrate on, in a substantive way on individual practices and each event is dedicated to an influential figure in the field of contemporary art and, and visual culture, investigating their work and thinking, their histories, trajectories, and processes. So we're incredibly pleased that uh, artist John Knight agreed to be in dialogue with Bettina this evening. John has lived for the last 45 years in Los Angeles and works in situ. In a recent talk at University of Washington School of Art, he qualified this latter statement by stating that, I'm part of a grumpy group, a generation of artists that decided to leave the studio and essentially work by the notion of invitation or commission, which is very against the history of a certain notion of the artist as having an autonomous position, not just with the studio, but with the relationship of where, when, and how one might produce. Since the late 1960s, John's work has been grounded in an address of sight working in the situation, not on the situation, particularly articulating the ideological and ar architectural parameters of the museum, gallery, and public sphere. His work can be seen to extend from the critical address of spatial concerns raised by minimalism, while taking on but diverse forms of intervention through publications, commodities, graphics, and architecture. So on Saturday, an exhibition by John opened at Red Cat in Los Angeles, and he's also had recent exhibitions at Green Neftali here in New York, at the Art Institute of Chicago, and at Porticus in Frankfurt. He was included in the Whitney Biennial 2012, curated by Jay Sanders and Elizabeth Sussman. And to introduce Bettina, uh, before handing over to her, Bettina Funk is an art historian, writer, and editor. She is the author of Pop or Populous, Art Between High and Low, published by Sternbo Press in 2009, and she leads seminars on contemporary art in the Critical Theory and the Arts Master Program at the School of Visual Arts. She was the head of publications for Documenta 13, producing a range of publications that included the notable series 100 Notes, 100 Thoughts. So before handing over to Bettina, I'd just like to take this opportunity to uh, thank, in a big way, all the supporters of Artist Space who make our programs such as this possible. Uh, especially the friends of Artist Space and the artists who have contributed to the um, Artist Space Program Fund. And we'd like to extend a special thank you tonight to Eleanor Kerr for her support of this evening's program. So over to you, Bettina. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, John. I'm so glad you accepted I did. I my invitation yeah, yeah. to come and speak yeah, it's my here pleasure. with me. I miss Bernie today, but, um, but I have my pen somewhere. <laughs> so the ones who've been here before to one of the talks know that I always like to start at the beginning or a beginning, um, looking at where things started to form um, at a time that we maybe haven't spoken so much about, um, to see what happened there that we can still find in the work until today. And so in your case, John, you started stu studying architecture and stop the studies how, how <laughs> before you were done. And um, at the same time, architecture is in your genes, you told me, and it's part of your work. You moved on to go to the artist, Otis College for Art and Design, and also didn't finish the studies there, didn't like the classes, and spent a lot of time in the library instead, looking at books this library happened to have all the books you wanted to see in the journals of the conceptual artists that were working at that time. And I thought we could start talking about these interrupted studies and sort of an escapist move from one place to another. Well, 
I did say that it's in my genes, that's true. And I said that because when I was a... You want to start at the beginning, right? Uh -huh. When I was a very <laughs> young child, uh, later my parents had informed me that when we would visit friends in their houses and go to places, the very first thing I wanted to do, I would do is take off and go through their house. And I remember my parents told me, he's very, has a strange relationship to architecture. He likes to see where all the rooms are located. And, things like that. and you mean all the rooms? Yeah, I knew all the rooms. And, and my favorites were what I would call upstairs, downstairs houses, which translates roughly as mo multiple stories. So it was in my, it's in my genes, yeah. And yet I'm, I think I'm very autodidactic around it. It was just a passion uh, which you, then you decide you have to carry it through with some formality. So I went to architecture school and was deeply disappointed in the pedagogy, the structure of it. Uh, I had had this notion since I loved upstairs, downstairs houses, that there was this notion about the scale of the domestic or the scale of small civic uh, multi-use buildings to be my notion of what... Uh, architecture should be about, that it's more holistic and humanistic. Mm -hmm. And you could deal with it with a certain sense. And there, I, I, had early, uh, I was an early fan of people like Charles Moore and others, like, and, and of course became a huge fan of Venturi Scott Brown and architecture and science. But uh, the architectural education I uh, experience was one of very large-scale civic institutionalized structures. The projects would be, for example, uh, an airport as a second-year design student. Um, those projects disallowed someone to be able to get deeply involved in, in the intricacies of, the, of something. Uh, this is the kind of a project that 40 people would do in a big office. And yet you were a second-year architecture student, and you had to deal with these things. I thought they were completely absurd and un unrealistic. And one would only really get as far as maybe a, a schematic level of understanding of something. I just thought it was uh, useless and a waste, an, ec an ecological disaster in a way. You know, the money, time, and energy to it. Um, I later... Uh, had the opportunity to teach for a few years in architecture school in Los Angeles, SciArc, if some of the people know it. At one point, and when I was there, it was really like rough and rugged. And they were in a, a warehouse, and it was a, a model after the AA or something like that. And, uh, everything went, it didn't matter what the things were. And I uh, did a fifth year uh, studio project in one of those years, and I gave them a bus stop. And I was reprimanded severely by the, by the dean of the student for thinking, how dare you would give such a project to uh, fifth-year advanced students. And so, well, it's a simple structure which can be, have very complicated, complex implications. And I must say, and I'm, jump, I'm sorry, I'm jumping mm -hmm. from, but I must say that out of maybe 20 projects, there were two or three that had any complexity at all. So whether it was an airport or a bus stop, it didn't seem to matter as far as in the, develop, the potential development, lack of development of a project. Now, I'm, I'm back up. So I, uh, had a, I went through a period of time at architecture school, and I decided that this uh, was not at all for me. And it, it's interesting, and uh, I must say also that I've come to decide that I think um, timing is 95% of life. Because I left this organization, this school, this enterprise, and very, very shortly afterwards, the dean was fired, and the new dean was Charles Moore, and he immediately brought in Venturi, Scott Brown, and others, and I, I thought, oh, my God. It's like, so what time are we talking about? What year are we we're talking, talking about? about uh, we're talking about just after the turn of the um, 20th century, about 1902, 1904, or something. <laughs> we're, we're talking about the early 60s. We're talking, well, I'm old. We're talking about the early 60s. And it's this sense that uh, how it's just past ships passing. Seth, look at Seth because it's writing. You know, you're just like this. And you, but you just keep moving. You know, you can't 
turn around. But in all, in all I think it was, it was that kind of serendipity of change that also was very valuable. But it is ironic sometimes. So I went to, I decided, well, I had taken art history courses and I had taken a sculpture course or two as electives. So I decided, well, I'll go to art school. And that seems to be this place maybe where I can operate on a certain kind of scale. Uh, and so I moved back to Los Angeles. I looked in the phone book. I saw Otis and I applied, which was also a, a, like a, Planning is something very important in life, I guess, but I'm not very good. I, 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 it, it was a disaster. It was this Beaux-Arts education, figure sculpture, and, and, we're, you know, and, and it's a long time ago, but not that long ago, right? It's, it's not, you know, Baroque period or something. And it was just dismal. But the library was fantastic. And this is now mid-60s, right? In Los Angeles, a librarian in the small art school had put together this library that it had Stanley Brown. I mean, there's people, and they just all the Encore, people, you know, Ian Wilson, people who had not any library in Cal Arch or anything else would have had that years later, right? So, what so, were you thinking when you, I assume you encountered these without any introduction? You just. I had, the, I had, a, I had, I had a relative modernist and, you know, uh, pre modern introduction to art. Mm -hmm. And I was relatively unmoved by it. I'm not particularly a big fan of art. I, I just, it's not the place where I locate uh, certain kinds of interest and, and meaning. Uh, I love surfing and, and, uh, and uh, architecture and things like that. So, but I went because I thought, well, maybe this is the space I could do something. And, the library, and I, I had this huge experience in education in this library. And the, and the person, the woman who ran it was extraordinarily bright. And she knew my problem. And there were three or four others. And we, she would just let us hang out all the time, mm -hmm. night and day, and just like this. So I failed, flunked out uh, the first year because I wasn't really a, attentive to my course studies. Right? You and passed the library, though. I passed library, I think, anyway. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so that was, uh, um, I, think, I, I, I think that um, this whole institutionalized learning curve that we all experience is something that I found to be, it's like a, um, re you need a reaction formation to it of some kind. Mm -hmm. I've always thought that you go, you go to these institutions and the most valuable thing about them is they make you react to them, and then decide what you think is not going on in these places, then you have to formulate your own s notion of things. I think this kind of reaction formation creates a pot potential for critical operation, mm -hmm. if you could escape the institution. Yeah. I just thought I'd bring that in, because, yeah, yeah. because I, s or I'm just a, a, a loser when it comes to institutional relationships. Because I seem to have gone from one to the other to the other, you know, but so I make my way to art. Well, formation as reaction sounds productive, but you are saying we're in the mid '60s, and then the first work that I know of you is, I assume, uh -huh. the uh, wait, wait, well, um, slightly earlier, but slightly yeah. which one? We had a, a work in the show. Uh, Caroline last oh. fall. It's slightly earlier, but but yes, you're right. In inch to a foot. Yeah, well, there, yeah. yeah, there were the corner. Um, um, oh, the, the video. The, oh, yeah. oh. That's but like '69. Yes, 69. but there there were a few other things going on in that period of time, 1968. A lot of activity on the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, some uh, issues of trying to escape the, the dismal uh, political character, you know, problems of time, which consumed, I think, with many people, it consumed the two or three years of my time, moving and re realigning myself and, you know, surviving, basically, and, moving, and then moving back into a place of trying to pr produce, trying to start to produce again. It's a pretty rough time, you know. Uh, and some decisions by certain people, like myself, had to be made about what to do about that. You know. 
Yeah, I mean, is this something you can speak about? What brought you back into this practice of, after the turmoil and the f trying to find your place, very political time, and then re-entering? Well, I don't think that I, I, w I wouldn't call it going back in because I wasn't really in at the time. The position of the student or mm -hmm. something like that, I don't think really is, is the dedicated position of in. It's an interesting position, possibly, for the, what you may do. To consider, yeah. yeah. But, it, but any, uh, I think any other kind of sense of locating a site of production would have been, for me, and I know others, quite difficult after that, those period, that period of time. So I think it probably pushed people further into critical corner, you know, positions of activity, and then to find out how you might produce you know, those, rela those reactions, mm -hmm. you know, f what the formation of them would be. Um, I, uh, so I think, Richard, you said something about, or you did, maybe you did, about uh, re uh, leaving the studio. I want to actually, from my feeling about it, I don't think I was ever in the studio. I would say that you could say that about some of my peers, like, Daniel Buren, Michael, mm. although Michael, what people Asher? never think of him, Michael. Asher, I'm mm. sorry, mm. never think of him, he either being in this studio, but he had a background, education, cultural experience that, that he was deeply involved, or his family, or his experiences were with contemporary art, big collections, being around all, all these things. That uh, wasn't my background experience. So he, you know, in a, in a, in a abstract way, left the studio, I think. But I would have to say, honestly, that um, I never recognized or understood the studio. Uh, as I never recognized or understood uh, meaning with specificity. So would you say you, you were in a house? You were? I went. Instead of saying I, I left the studio, you said like I always was in <coughs> In the house? In the house, at my desk, or is there any... F I think I... I mean, let, me, let me see how I... Because I'm not clear about this myself, mm. really. Mm -hmm. Because I've always felt that I left the studio. Mm -hmm. But in recent always years... Always already. Recently, I've been, I've been trying to trace when I was in it. Uh -huh. No, I had uh, the sense of, you know, uh, went on to school, um, taking care of some of this other political business, and thinking that I needed a place to work, and that's the studio. But I must say that I ha I've had these spaces, and uh, there would be six or eight months go by when I didn't know what to do, whether I needed a typewriter or a bench press or something. I had no real idea of, of what I needed, mm. what it, how you would define the studio. And I think it's because I, I, had, I had no strong relationship to a certain kind of genre mm. or a desire to work in a certain conventional way. It just has, I have no sense of that. It makes, it, and it makes no sense to me. Well, it's place, always made no sense to me. A place to work, has, I, I like that phrase, a place to work, because it has the openness that I wanted to address. And we can go back to the early moment again, but I, it's, it's just offers itself. Because I, um, just a couple of days ago, after reading so much about your work and looking at all the books, and you normally, well, you always organize the information about the history of your, what you did with the bibliography and not with a list of exhibitions. And um, I realized, so what did John actually make? What is the physical form of the works over the 40 something years you? You uh, made various projects, and um, we spoke about this earlier today, that in the 70s, there's this sort of more purist, um, language-based work in relation to space, spatial experience, architecture. And then in the 80s, you're making sort of semi-autonomous artworks, works that are made for a site, but they can leave and also exist elsewhere, like the Mirror series in the 86, or the museo types, uh, the series of China plates with museum maps printed on them, or um, what's the other one? Oh, the, the JK mm. um, wrapped with posters 
of advertisements for, for travel, tourist advertisement around your JK relief. Um, and then you sort of stop after the 80s, pretty much withdraw from making those kinds of objects and you start to make more in situ work, like which is, shows great freedom of formats and methodology. Like you go and make all kinds of works depend, like dependent very much always on the specific place you're in. You know, mm -hmm. it can be a garden, it can be a rain, not a garden, but like changing the parameters of an ex the existence of a garden, a rain chain, it, you know, like, a, like a, an imprint in a wall. It, so suddenly you're not, like you say, I'm interested in things, but not in a whole genre or in one medium. And I, I travel around. And I feel like when you speak early on for, about, like, I needed a space to work that already shows a focus, a specificity, but at the same time, you know, this, this direction that you're going and eventually you go very, you know, like into a very broad practice. Mm -hmm. Is that a question? Um, I mean, no, I it's a description. Yes, I, it is. Um, it's le uh, excellent, lovely. Um, can you go on? I want to hear more. <laughs> I'm curious. I wish I could, but I, um, <laughs> maybe I can go on if I hear yeah, yeah, something if I, from if you. I <laughs> I, we have had these conversations, very interesting ones, actually. Um, there is that sense that I am part of a certain, in the late 60s, early 70s, it seems like what I, in, what I do fits rather neatly into uh, this moment of conceptual art and there were the evacuation of the site or, or the, 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 the kind of grounding of a notion of an institutional observation, I like to say, or they would say critique, uh, although that, apparently that term was uh, authored by someone 25 years younger than me, but that's okay. We, we knew it was there already. But, uh, um, the, um, but I think what, for me, it was that I wasn't interested in, particularly interested, nor have I ever been in this kind of orthodox conceptual thinking rigor. But it seemed like the, the way that work was put together or brought into existence was that it was, it's very rigorously conceptual activity which I sometimes have very difficulty seeing in certain kinds of historical mediums mm. uh, or getting to, or, uh, which meant it seemed like that is a kind of way, or this is a posse that I could hook up to, but not necessarily because I was thinking through these rather rigorous conceptualist moments or that the, let's see, the, I was gonna say eradication, but that's not altogether fair the evacuation of the traditional medium or object. Because I really necessarily didn't and still don't have a particular interest in those at all. Uh, I think it was just, it looked like the kind of place where, of a certain kind of freedom maybe. And mm -hmm. this is, of course can be anywhere from deeply naive to vastly romantic conversation, but a uh, certain kind of opening or freedom, and it, I say this in an odd way, but I mean it, of expression mm -hmm. without <laughs> the historical uh, conventions of material or object production that would come, to, come together with them mm. normally. Mm. Uh, I, I ha I've always been very allergic to the idea of of uh, what I made or my reason for making something was to become a certain kind of cust custodian for history, you know, for, for a certain kind of set of materials, procedures, or activities, which I sometimes feel that's what some work, how some work operates. It's not my custodial duty to continue to make sure that painting survives or moves along or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I never, it just even, it's not even, don't, don't dawn on it. I mean, you know, like, so I guess I would say where Daniel Buren obviously was, and I've said this before, because this tripartite uh, conversation is endless to boring. Michael Asher, John Knight, and Daniel Buren. You know. We've got, we're it's not that, that boring. We, well, <laughs> the, the, the uh, 
suture, you know. Mm. We got rid of that at least in the foreword in our, for our conversation. Uh, to shake that thing has been pretty rough. But I, as I said before, uh, I think that when it comes to painting uh, and sculpture production in its most notions of convention and the expansion of that site, mm -hmm. that certainly one would, it would be hard pressed not to say that Danielle painting and Michael's sculpture put up a pretty broad swath of property, mm. which we find is very difficult, particularly Michael, to get around. And I think Benjamin's comment that uh, 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 Michael Asher and the end of sculpture is pretty much accurate in a way. Uh, the, the discursivity of sight and material and activities that he put out there were awesome at the least, right? I, on the, on the other hand, f um, feel that I dip, don't play e to either one of those parties and seem to be uh, a, kind of a third, uh, kind of a um, uh, um, fortunate odd man out. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, so it left me with, well, uh, I'm free in this perverse way. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now, I know, and I say that with a certain diversity, you know, but, um, uh, but it, did, it did not allow me, but I had no immediate place to go. So I think it allows for the idea of being able to uh, think, in, in, I don't know, a third curve or something like that. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but... Uh, well, the uh, third curve is in dialogue with... Um you know, certain developments of decades, like this, is like this relationship of conceptual art, and and of course, especially you know what what will then be called institutional critique one day in the 70s and the and the very beginning, and then in the 80s with these semi-autonomous objects, they do, they for mm -hmm. me they exist in a loose dialogue with like you know like a, the art practice is changing. Mm -hmm. And even where you then go in the 90s and zeros, see, there seems to be more room to sort of move with how, how practice and reception and distribution of work changes than, I mean, if you want to compare, like, mm -hmm. like Michael Asher or Daniel Bruen. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I was actually, I think, in a way, I was trying to create separation, uh, you know, and the sovereignty of each of these people who have been, you know, really pushed together and so constantly time and again but I did I guess I was floating around in the 70s in that conversation mm -hmm. if we want to take it to the 80s so to speak it was that uh, there were certain kinds of object signs I think that were necessary I think right? mm. I, mean, it's, I did them but uh, that were necessary to produce to to locate a site within the, a construct mm -hmm. like let's say the J JK is a documenta uh, that so to tag that site, so they utilize very you might even say traditional elements or objects. Mm, mm -hmm. you know, but it was more to bring the receiver to that kind of a site, like the utility staircases at the Documenta, mm -hmm. a completely abject location for even considering. I think, at one point, for most people to oh, consider. Even though almost everyone walks up and down those stairs. Most of the people they, walk there most of the time. And, mm, similar uh, to, I mean, this is like the tucked away or overlooked mm -hmm. space, but at the same time, it's a, a, a passage that most people yeah, well, encounter. There, yeah, it's interesting that there's been a lot of conversation, a lot. There's been some conversation about how cryptic my work is and hard to find or see. And I've always found that rather humorous because even if you take the, the JKs, it's like, you know, they're screaming out to you like Nike, but, uh, but they're, they're in your face and you pass them. And the reason why I use that staircase and the reason why there's the multiple of them, although they're not a multiple exactly because they're all original, different, mm. uh, is because this is the way advertising operates. You mm. see this thing over and over again. You keep passing it, and we know that. That's an old trope, but it's an interesting one still that I think it clearly still operates. But, but at the same time, there's, there usually, in many cases, the first thing you might see, this is very funny to me, People lined up to get into the exhibition. They stood within four feet of the ch the, thi the thing, right? And it was like, like uh, it, it's it's there, but n not supposedly be because there are cryptic aspects to. They 
we know that artists have done and used everything today, but at the same time, we can see that there are aspects to things that if they don't register as traditional or conventional signs of certain kinds of objects, mm -hmm. you know, they just disappear. And that's a quote, cryptic aspect to it, I guess. But, you know, uh, so in the 80s, I, I did make these things, some of them very stand-up objects and very conventionally expressed, like uh, the mirrors in... in uh, 1986 and Marion Goodman Gallery, something like that. At the same time, I, 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 would, I could see that I would, would prefer to get outside of that space in a way, or on the fringe of that space, or so a footnote of, of those conventional sites of exhibition, and to detach myself from having to produce these auxiliary objects that would then sign or signal some or aesthetic reception or trigger something, and see how that would work. And when, you, when I speak about, or we speak about something like the MOCA uh, project, which many people may not know, but it's, it's, it's like an architectural, um, um, what do you call it, an architectural? Um, yeah. yeah. Cornerstone. Cornerstone, thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> but had something to do with, uh, I have these plants all around the room, so that... <laughs> the pay, too. <laughs> when, when the aging comes in, I hear, I, I wink and someone goes, cornerstone. <laughs> uh, ve very cryptic in one way, but very aware of itself and in front of re reception, traffic, you know. And what did you do there, so to let Yes, the what I did there was, I, uh, the, the exhibition was um, about MOCA and its history. And the title of the exhibition was uh, The Artist's Museum. Uh, and uh, I happen to be old enough and around and long enough in Los Angeles to know that th that was the most absurd uh, possible reference you could make to MOCA, as you can get in Los Angeles. What happened, as people may not know, that we, we one museum was built called the Contemporary, was Contemporary, whatever. Uh, and it was a beautiful, simple structure, Frank Gehry's best building, to be sure. But that's only because he, he had a tiny budget. So you can't, you can't, you know, you can't, he can't wound too much when you have a small budget. But essentially, it was, it was, I, I would say, a breakout type of structure and program. Uh, that has a, a, uh, influenced a lot of architecture and institutions since. Uh, just a, basically a gutting of the interior uh, site remodel, uh, open program, uh, do what you want, drill holes in the floor, break down the walls. You know, it's something that people thought about many times and have experienced in few cases, that kind of openness and expression of the institution. Um, but there was also, on the other side of that coin, uh, the insistence as there is ubiquitously, to have a diamond on the hill, so to speak. And that hill, of course, in Los Angeles was Bunker Hill, which was used to be a hill before they shaved the top of it off and developed it with corporate architecture. But it, so we got MOCA. And from the very beginning of the program, it was geared toward the collector and the board, and fa it faces the corporate uh, mindset. In fact, the first show was uh, of the collection of, uh, presented a collection of nine of the biggest collectors and the board. So, and there was a big fight by many people to uh, stop the building of that and just keep the temporary contemporary. Mm. And uh, that's the temporary, it's a great, even a great name for a place, temporary contemporary. It's such a beautiful use of play with words. Uh, but uh, so anyway, that didn't happen. So my response to when I was invited to be in the show was to, to discuss that. So I made a, a, a project text for it. I call them rants. Uh, they're more like a rant than they are a proposal. Because you know, there's a page. Well, there was one up here earlier. It was a Whitney. Um, you, the project proposals slash rants. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's usually rant slash project. Oh. Also, big. Uh, usually three quarters of the page is really a rant, you know. And uh, then at the bottom, I, I, I'm, that's the least creative part of it because I always say, almost always, I say, therefore. And then I present this one liner about what, what the project will be about. But that project was about taking the title 
and putting it into a cornerstone on the, and putting it against one of the columns of the museum. If that's true at MoCA, if it's really the artist's museum, so why don't we recuperate that idea and put it in stone, so to speak, the artist's museum. So that project was simply a, uh, we etched into the existing uh, stone of the building on the bottom of the column where you'd put it in a timely manner, a timely place, the, the title of the museum. So, so to speak, that's maybe a signature move. So to speak? So to speak. Yeah. Don't, you mean the language? Like, well, if you say you put it into stone, so to speak. Yes. Uh, well, that it's sounds a, like well, it's kind of a corny... Uh, a uh, metaphor, but or something like that. And so I had, uh, so I say, so to speak. Isn't that what people say when they, they make a big proposition and then they say, so to speak. You know, so they don't, they don't really stand by it. You can just use that sleight of hand language, right? Yeah. I like yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, I, it's, you know, I won't go on to another anecdote. I just anecdote, wanted to point that out. No, I, yeah. I, 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 th I thank you for it. I, I, I use them as often as I can. <laughs> or like a nod to. Mm. I like that one too, a nod to, you know, <laughs> to, the, to the museum. That's in this one, or wherever this one was. We made a, I had to spruce up uh, the, this building as a nod to the noble new tenant that would be leasing the building, the Met. Because there was a, there was a unfinished element, from my mind, in this. Uh, this uh, faux, by the way, brutalist building, because it's not a true br brutalist building, because it's skinned in limestone and has, am I going off? Can we just say it's from 2012? Oh, yes. Your uh, contribution yeah. to the biennial Sorry, where Jay yeah. Sanders invited you and it's called... And Elizabeth called, Sussman. And Elizabeth Sussman, yeah, excuse yeah. me. Uh, it's right. called A Tranquil Reminder, just to... Yeah, the, the rant is called A Tranquil Reminder and it starts like somewhere above the 75th uh, uh, street uh, hump. On Madison Avenue. That's like, so to speak, hump. But there is a, there is a hump, you know, and they call it that, right? And, uh, and it goes on to talk about, the, we have it here, we could read it, but I mean, who's a good reader? Well, I read it many times and with a dictionary. No, we don't want to, okay. <laughs> okay. In, in, in any event, uh, my, my assessment of the site was that um, there, there was one missing link to the completion of the work, and that was the, the uh, scupper. And we have a sketch basin, but we had no rain chain. You know. And the scupper is not bronzed, and all the handle hardware, everything in the museum is bronzed. And so, um, uh, that's I, uh, so I felt that in order to prepare it for the normal client, we had to complete it. So we made a bronze hood that we slipped over the steel scupper, and then we made a bronze rain chain and came down. We got some river rocks. A friend of mine over here bought the river rocks, and, you know, she, and we put them in. Something about this kind of work. Now, and this, um, this so is you what, also made with concrete the... No, the con no, it was there. So there's all the uh, indications of the... So it was really the, unfinished. It was, <laughs> it was really unfinished. And it was certainly less than noble. Uh, and... Uh, in fact, it's kind of fake, this building. But I'm not a fan, as you can probably guess, of, the, of, uh, <laughs> of this kind of stuff. But so, uh, um, so we did that. And so when we speak about, I personally feel, in my slightly less than humble way, that there has been kind of a breakaway of thinking and production on my part in the last 15 years or so. Something I think I always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't, I couldn't quite, well, it's practice, you know, it's in a practice. I couldn't, I, I guess I've made my way there. My feeling is I'm interested more in a certain kind of, if we can say so, significant, whatever, to whatever scale that is, gesture, than I'm to work. Uh, something that uh, is there and can stay there. I was going to yeah. say, it's not a yeah. performance that happens and passes, the gestures, the material. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, because I, this is something that my great dear friend, uh, Michael, and I had a difference about. Mm -hmm. There was, at one side, there was, an, there was the insistence, and I think I, I understand why, and it's a very uh, uh, important part to the practice, his practice, which everything insistently had to be taken back to its original state. 
after the exhibition. And it's, and it's something that I, I too hold to in certain ways, but I've always wanted to become more polluted and find a way for it to stay in some form. And so that is something that is actually uh, an improvement to a situation or you know, a prosthesis to something. So the pollution you call ex, ex situ? The pollution I have called ex situ. Mm -hmm. And that was another, that's, a, that's yet another conversation, right? Mm. This is a separation of uh, a long di debate between Daniel and Buran and I. Uh, I don't think it ends with in situ. It begins with in situ and goes out. Mm -hmm. So I would, with him, I would, we would it's, a, it's a play of words, but I think it, it, there's much, there's more to it and then a play of words. Like all play of words, there's more to them, I think. And so uh, it, 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 it expands the site somehow. Uh, in, in, in one way uh, that I find uh, to be different than some of the other practices that it can't, it, and one thing I would say to, to younger artists, and some old ones too actually, by the way, uh, is um, in order to make certain gestures, I think, for example, for me, for example in this, it, it can't lose its utility, form of utility, because if it slips over and becomes only the moment of that aesthetic situation, it, 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 um, it puts itself in jeopardy, uh, so that this can slip back into utility. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, if when it was there after the exhibition, it was no longer, as far as I'm concerned, a work in the exhibition it became something that one might say is uh, a work, a past work in storage because they didn't buy it. So uh, that makes a difference too if we want to speak about certain politics, right? And um, it, it does perform its function, its utilitarian function. And this is something that I find extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. And if you can have that in the work, if the work starts to get in trouble in one place, it, it has some place to slip to. You know, it, it, can, it can kind of slip and slide in a way. Uh, and this is very interesting to me. And what was also interesting was, and I, in both Jay and I in particular are hoping for, some kind of a potential negotiation between the Whitney and the Met, uh, uh, that this would stay. And then it would be interesting about whose ownership it might be. Mm -hmm. And this is an institutional or uh, administrative kind of, let's say, conversation that I find to be interesting. Because it's not in the front of the work, but it's kind of perversely in the back of the mm -hmm. work. It's the back story. You know? And uh, because it's on the property of one person, but it, it, it could have been in the lease ownership of another. And the, the authorship or the ownership of it, you know, not in a strongly institutionally critical way, but as a kind of anecdotal aspect of propriety. You know, of course, that necessitates those parties to participate, you know, but uh, you, can't, you can only do so much weaseling. Mm -hmm. you know. And what happened to the piece? The piece is, is quietly in storage. And where? I mean, is it your, your storage? Your well, I don't know if we should reveal oh, that, okay, but good. should we? We don't have to. Should we um, reveal that? Uh, okay, uh, somebody um, uh, shook her head, so we won't reveal yeah. it. But, but, <laughs> well, that's, you, you made that very sleight of hand uh, uh, gender <laughs> thing is somebody, but she. So we're ahead. There are not uh, enough women in the audience uh, tonight. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I, am, I am ambling, I know that, but. Well, ambling around, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to talk about how you arrive at a project proposal like this? I mean, of course, you pace around the museum and you think about it. Can you speak a little more? I'm curious, how do you arrive at well, finding the site or finding, you know, well, go, do you go through various other proposals that stall or? Sometimes I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's not a patent uh, procedure, but um, let's see if we back up a little bit, maybe. Um, I, I, I don't, uh, let, me, let me make it into more general. Mm -hmm. I don't, uh, there's not an applied gen, uh, general methodology to how I will approach 
to solve a problem, I think. I think I do, but uh, I, I also find that to be a little tricky because I don't, you don't want to close down the possibilities of using some other faculties one might have to come to something okay, in general. Right? Now, and oftentimes I come to something and uh, I guess when you get older you start to believe in a lot of these things. It's kind of like being an agnostic. I believe in much more and more these days in serendipity. I believe much more and more in intuition. It's also corny, but you know. Uh, I, and I say it for this reason. I say it because um, uh, I've had a number of uh, times I've had these ex experiences of running the, I'll have, a, I'll have an interesting immediate kind of observation and then I'll feel guilty or something. Mm -hmm. And then I'll run the gamut of uh, endless numbers of possibilities. Just, you know, <laughs> because I also like to get to the edge of the playing field. You know, see how close you can get to bad. Like, I'm a great, uh, I, 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 I deeply agree with uh, Denise Scott Brown when she says, uh, my bad is better than your bad. Getting that close to, to bad is sometimes the best place to be because mm -hmm. it's the one with the enormous or up the most risk right on the edge of the playing field and so I go all over this playing field it's like you know some I mean just awful ideas you know yeah. and, and, but 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 I've always I've always believed that uh, like we we had this conversation earlier today I, I think uh, uh, these are such corny terms but I believe in them uh, great work uh, is done by people who have the capability of also doing awful work. Mm -hmm. And the ones who can't do awful work never do the other. It's kind of a half-baked theory, but I really believe that. Because it's in relation to risk. And with risk, you can, you know, uh, you might cross over the line and, you know. But, and on either side. Yeah, but, yeah on the other side. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, it, but, but in the final analysis, so what? You know, what's the, what's the goal here? You know, you know. And, this, that's, and I won't give everybody my anecdote, my Miles Davis anecdote, but, but, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it, it's this idea. Of, it's a good one. Though. It's, it's a really good one. And uh, you would like it if I, if, if, I, if I would give it to you, but I don't want to. Like, uh, I don't want to waste your time. Uh, uh, but I, maybe. Pardon me? Uh, anyway, it, it is about that kind of thing. Maybe it is a good idea to give the anecdote because it's like, uh, it's really, it's does, because I'm really sincere about it. Like, uh, 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 there's a radio station, jazz station in LA, and they like probably be here on the anniversaries of certain people, the, the great ones. They play their music all day, and then they have interviews they play and things like that about these people. And they have this one fabulous Miles. It's a radio interview with a very well known jazz critic from Los Angeles. You know? And he, he, they, he, they start talking and the jazz critic says, uh, uh, Miles, you know, we all love you. You're, you know, the people are behind you and, you know, you're fantastic and miles in the sky and miles ahead and blue miles and, you know, you're, we just, you just have the people. You just have the, you know, it's like this and that. And then he's going, no, you don't hear miles. He's just in the background somewhere. Right? You know? and, um, and then he, this guy goes along and then, then he turns. And he starts to say, but you know, Miles, um, you know, I mean, we love you, Miles, but you know, this latest uh, stuff, music, that latest album that you know, has come out is like, I don't know, you know, the, the people, you know, like this. And, and <laughs> there's this pregnant pause. And then all you hear Miles say is, people are shit. <laughs> Just like that. Just like that. And the, and the guy, oh, but I didn't mean that, uh, you know, um, you know, and it was on the, it was at the time of Bitches Brew, right? So you just say, you know, now we know that Bitches Brew is like, you know, there's generations of, you know, but that, that's the kind of thing, you know, that, that's this kind of notion. If you, it's, and Miles can do, it's capable of doing very bad things sometimes. He's a terrible draftsman and painter, you know. But at the same time, so what? You know, it's his, it's, his, it's, his, it's his problem, right? It's like, who's going to, you know, it's my problem, right? If I do a piece of shit, it's my piece of shit. 
<laughs> you know, not yours or yours or anybody else's. And I think that's, that's, part, that's real authorship. That's really taking agency, mm -hmm. right? I just always loved that. Just in Miles, of course, that voice is just like, just like nails, last nail in the coffin, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that, anyway, that's my anecdote, which has driven me, you know, to... And another great one, which I won't talk about, really, is the where someone uh, locates uh, their... Um, um, what can I say? Where, they, where one defines creativity. You know, interesting how narrow it is. Mm -hmm. If it's in the visual arts, we always go to art, a sculpture, a painting, and whatever. So, and you know, for me, it's uh, it's so uh, uh, discursive. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite people in the world is Muhammad Ali. This guy is just out of the ballpark. You know, the rope dope was one of the great moments of creativity in history. You know, and I won't give it, but everybody knows it, right? But, uh, but that's another aspect of this. It's the narrowness of look, or, or what you look at, or you look to, and that's a way, another reason why I think the notion of being within histories too tightly, or being within genres too tightly, is really restricting. When if you say an anecdote, you give that example to people, or student stuff, it's stunning how uh, it doesn't register. They don't read creativity in it because it's not the, it's, it doesn't create the same kind of materials or elements that they're so closely bound to that they identify with. Yeah. And then you think, well, if they don't identify with those kinds of extraordinary moments of creativity, then they don't, they don't, they don't see it within their own genre or something. They don't see it within their own, I mean, you know, if you ask them what a good painter is or something, you're some stunned by the answer sometimes, you know. But anyway, that's... Um, so this is... In response to my question, how you arrived I, I guess, at the rain yeah. chain? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, not really, I guess. But I do, I do honestly, uh, I think I have this uh, elliptical way of thinking. And uh, I had somebody uh, ask, we were doing some business together, sitting down right before my show in 2011 with Carol Green. And we were going to talk some business, and I broke out the um, uh, rope dope uh, I think, and I know it was like, what are you talking about? And, I, and I, I'm sure, I actually don't I think I didn't really quite understand why I did that. You know. But yes, it was an, my elliptical way to getting around to you know, something, but uh, that was my elliptical way. How do I get to it? Um, um, I come with some background understanding of places, particularly, particularly the architecture. Mm -hmm. and, and in this case, a, a collective exhibition like that, which is very difficult for me to participate in because of how I want to work. Uh, and I have some certain thoughts about the Whitney Museum f for many years and, uh, and about architecture and how architecture, the desire uh, foundation and principle of architecture is played out in a very perverse way. Uh, there's a very famous, the most famous East Coast architectural photographer who made this building famous. It's always been uh, uh, very ironic to me that the two-dimensionality of photographic production is what has driven the fame of three-dimensional construction. I think that's really bizarre. Right? And if you look at the uh, Stoller photographs of this building, they have this kind of, this is how I did mm. get to this, they mm -hmm. have this kind of uh, bronze tint to them, this kind of uh, patina and all of these things of course from a, a, a professional like that you can be sure they are very well thought out so we have a building that, a photograph that cre creates this really uh, perverted desire formation about this place you know, and its openness and its beauty and its you know it's really, and so the, the, the use of uh, the pictorial in uh, the propagandistic drive, you know, is one. The second one is, uh, I've always found this building to be, uh, what one would say, the least uh, uh, um, accepting, the least inclusive piece of modernism. Of course, in general, modernism has this problem uh, of almost any building in the 20th century. If one looks at the building, it slipped into the corner Mm -hmm. 
And on each side of the building, it has massive concrete walls that go straight up and block the five-story housing on both sides. In other words, they just eradicated the context with these huge walls. And then within those walls sits this box. And the one relationship to the street is what I call the prosthesis. Mm -hmm. And then because of its profile, I then called it a duck because of my interest in uh, relationship to Venturi Scott Brown. Um, but uh, uh, originally this building wasn't to have any windows at all. And then the, the boards and people said, well, we have to have some opening to the street, some relationship to the context. Uh, th th this, the only thing that's brutalist about this building is uh, the architect's brutal behavior and class toward the site. Uh, if you knew something about real brutalist architecture, it's very humanistic, it's very holistic, it's expressing you know, the nuts and bolts a relationship between the user and materials and things like that. If you think of people like the Smithsons, the English architects, and other AA people, uh, I'm, when I say AA, I don't mean 12-step uh, architectural association. Uh, this is a completely different idea post-war, after the war, you know, the Barbican complex, uh, you know, these kinds of buildings. This guy is, is a, a pastitious, if that's a word, I don't know if it is, but uh, he creates, he, Builds pastiche, you know, so, but I won't go too far into that either. But these things triggered in me a certain aspect of how to approach this situation. It's not the only thing of mine in this show. I also asked to make a postcard because I always do make postcards and, and I utilize the space in the catalog for that. So there are two elements that make up the project. But I think it's a mystery in a way, unless you have a uh, routine program to approach your work, how things get done. If you ask a writer how they made, oh. you know, made it, yeah. uh, if you didn't say, how did you approach this novel, mm -hmm. then there, it's a loose canon situation. If you're not attached to a certain genre of writing, or purposely outside of it, then I think you have an, an, a whole different conversation about how does something get produced. You know? And I, we've spoken, I, I'm, I'm primarily interested in getting things made. And uh, I, I, I would be more comfortable talking, referring to them as stuff than I would art. I just think this is, this is a rather convenient site to work within. It gives a certain latitude. You can, you can, uh, these are all these, you can, you're free. <laughs> this is, I love to use these terms because it's, you're totally free, right? Well, we also spoke about, in this, was well, strange to arrive at these terms, like a certain domesticity as mm -hmm. part of, like, the sensibility of your work, something about the size and the intimacy, or in a more colloquial way, I said, you know, you make a place slightly more livable, you know, if you can think I said as like a very serious statement, not a statement in passing, or you mentioned lyrical conceptualism. I mean, those are, I, you know, until a few weeks ago, I never thought about your work in those terms, which, uh, yeah. you know, when you talk about, well, this conversation tonight, it sort of resonates with these terms, but it's surprising because, you know, like for in the, in the catalog uh, for the biennial, the artist pages, you left blank, right? It's sort of old school resistance. Well, that's... Right. Or is that a longer story? <laughs> so, no, no, no. Okay. It, it's uh, uh, the idea of leaving them blank was, was uh, the idea to leave them blank would have been a huge mistake because it's not about reflecting on early conceptual art evacuation of this and that. Mm -hmm. And I, w with the catalog designer, I, I must have told him a dozen times, please remember to re include the pagination. Oh, the pagination. Mm -hmm. Because they're not blank. Mm -hmm. And these are the things also I speak to other people who produce. These are the, quote, little things that are the things that get missed. You know, you can, and they're very, very important. Mm -hmm. at least to nerds, us nerds. But they do exactly, the empty pages do go back in history. The, the pages paginated, but with something in them, mm 
Mm -hmm. Don't, or go somewhere else. Yeah. But for me, that was a very crucial mistake. But mistakes happen. Yeah. You know, it's, so you, the, you, the, you, the page, you move on. You the live pagination in, is not printed on the page. No, you mean so it, you, yeah, you move on. But, so, but uh -huh. it was interesting that you uh -huh. would say that, because uh -huh. in fact, blank, yes. But of course, there was also a card in there. Oh, there was also a card. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's, uh, a yeah. there's a mailer in there. Uh -huh. And you tucked in on the title page a small logo of the duck. Yeah, we... Which we, we, is we, a uh, prominent site. I mean, normally it's the site for the owner of the, you know, for yeah. the publisher. And yeah. On the title page is the profile, a line drawing, or not even a line drawing, it's a block, black block, uh, of this bridge, which does ironically look like a duck. Kind of, you know, and, uh, and so uh, the person who... And I love him, he's a really good designer. It's, it's just a slip of the wrist on things like this, uh, pagination. Uh, but he um, really liked the duck. <laughs> you know, and uh, so he said to me once, Jay and I and he were working on the catalog, and they were going through the formal negotiation with the Whitney and with the Yale Press, because the Yale Press does a catalog. So there's, a, there's another anecdote about that, but I don't know if we want to do that. But, um, um, he said, can I use this duck somewhere? So I s said, um, um, where would you like it? You know, put it or something. I'd like to put it in the catalog. And I said, sure. You know, that's funny. You know, uh, and uh, I said, but it'll ne they'll never, you'll never get it past, <laughs> not to Whitney, I think, but past Yale Press. <laughs> you know, and uh, so I said, but I'll, t I'll tell you what. I've been around, I'm a, I'm a kind of a senior weaseler, and I've had to try and do this stuff a lot. And so I'll tell you what, I said, you tell them, and you do the rough, the mock-up with a duck on the spine. And you tell them that you really want it there. <laughs> but put it on the title page, and they will fiercely reject it on the spine and go right past the title page. Right? Because, and and I, got, I, got a, I got a phone call from him about, about 11 o'clock at night. I said, they had this fierce final meeting about improving, approving the catalog design. <laughs> and he said, God, John, you, how did you know that? It was like, I, I, did, I went, I want this on the spine. I really want the spine. And they said, absolutely not. <laughs> and then they turned the pages and they just went right past the <laughs> page. And, and they just went all through the catalog and they approved it. And he said, how do you know? I said, because you. Put it, you, pro, you put it somewhere you, where you know that they're not going to like it. And then you argue for that. And then you kind of say, oh, okay, fine. You know. But you've dropped it in somewhere else, right? And, and once they approved it, they don't. I don't even know, probably, the Yale Press probably never has seen it to, to this day. You know. <laughs> but now there's a logo on, on that catalog of this bridge. Right? <laughs> and, and those are the things that are fun. You know, that's, like, that's, what our, that's how we should make things, do things, right? I, that's how I want to make things. I should say, you know. Uh, well, yeah. publications are such an important form for you, as important, at least, as the other works. Um, that's very particular about your work. Also that they remain the same over 40 years. I mean, they look mm -hmm. basically, the, you know, the, the basic graphic design, the choice of the format, the choice of the, the paper, the material. So it's like a series. And um, a text, some photos, the bibliography. I mean, it's, it's also like a content formula, a not just a graphic formula. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, I assume you're thinking about how to, how to formulate the history of your work. Um, there's no book, there's no survey book. There's mm -hmm. no book that looks at your work as a whole. Uh, there hasn't really been an exhibition a retrospective, larger retrospective exhibition, except I just recently found out you had a five-day, four or five-day, four-decade spanning exhibition at the Schindler House last year during the Printed Matter Book Fair in LA. Mm -hmm. So um, I was wondering if you could talk about this a little bit. Are uh, you thinking about it? Are you rejecting certain things or are you like... Mm -hmm. um, 
it's it seems intentional that there's not a John Knight book that would look oh, at your uh, work as a whole. Yeah. Of, um, I don't know if I can speak about why there's not one, but I can speak about what, why there are this, the, this series of catalogs. And I would say, to begin with, uh, it's important to me and to everybody else that it's not another activity, but it's an expanded site of the work. So the catalog becomes, the work becomes, expands out to another, to this other site, expands out to the announcement site, and, and to me, altogether, and then with other possibilities, the site of the work can continue to span. Ex Spatially, temporarily. A and it ideological. Like or, or ideological. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It is ex situ. Mm -hmm. So the, ex the moment of the exhibition, and also this is a fundamental conversation about working like this, is conflating the moment of, of production and the moment of reception. Uh, and then from, I feel the moment of the exhibition is the beginning of this process. And these elements are conventions, existing conventions that are drawn into to, uh, to become a part of a larger um, uh, um, uh, constellation of elements to the site of the work. There are other aspects that can come into that, of course, where their work goes, and this and that, and all those things, you know, they can come into play. Um, this production of these documents is also based on a number of things. The idea is um, why wait for somebody else to produce something for you? Now, in this case, it's not exactly self-produced. There are producers outside of myself, but they are part of the realm of this larger constellation. But it's not that a gratuitous kind of when we're ready to produce you, or we're ready to commoditize you, or we're ready to do the kinds of things that, that this kinds of other secondary texts have the notion to do, or are applied and those times. These come with the project. So, uh, why are they the same template? My interest, uh, I have no, I should say I have very little to no interest in design, in the sense of the rudiments of graphic design, uh, how things are arranged necessarily, and doing that kind of work. Mm -hmm. But I have a very big interest and in beef with the ideology of design. I think it's the apparatus that runs the world that we live in, the corruption of the capitalist discourse and advertising and propaganda. It designed as a conceptual apparatus, that you know, designing desire, we know what that is. So, uh, to get around that for myself, we design originally a template, a site. Now, no more interest to design it in any other way. Mm -hmm. uh, blue it's done. one next time, a green one, it's done. Mm -hmm. And then inside the site, there's movement, which is specific to uh, each project. So there's a non relationship and a relationship. You know, they're part of a series, uh, and there's specificity within them. So they're general and they're specific. And so what happens once we just drop it in? And it's also, may, I might add, uh, and not might add, it's very important. I, I'm, I'm a huge believer in the economy of means. Make a format, finished. No excess, you know, necess necessity for that. It does the trick. If, it, if I felt it didn't continue to do the trick, then I would happily would, would, uh, move to something else. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not that's in concrete every day, I punch a time clock in for four years and that's the work, and if I miss a day, I slip my throat. You know, something like that. Which is this, you know, this hard knuckles, I think, right, misunderstanding of what a, a routine means. Mm -hmm. On Kawara, every day, he made, made, if he didn't finish a painting, it didn't matter. But, you know, mm -hmm. if, if when he lost his, when his stamp box for the postcards were stolen in, in uh, Stockholm during a retrospective, they, they panicked, the museum panicked, that was big news in Stockholm, and they interviewed on, and they said, what are you going to do now? And he said, well, I guess it's over. 
I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's just this kind of lyr lyrical behavior, mm -hmm. not the oh my God, you know, I missed a day, my career's my practice is finished, mm -hmm. you know, uh, this thing, and that's a huge difference in thinking and the expansion of uh, the flexibility uh, and, and a certain kind of modesty mm -hmm. and irony. It's like the, the, you know, things won't collapse, the world won't collapse if on sandbox gets stolen. The irony in it was really interesting. They, f they, they found it. Obviously, there was a lot of news media, and um, so probably it was put back by someone. You know. mm -hmm. And then there was an interview with on about that. They said, so, uh, uh, Mr. Kowar, what are you going to do now? And these are like mine, you know, they're like global questions that are answered. And this is what Chomsky says all the time. Global questions are answered. Well, I guess I'll just continue. It's like, mm -hmm. what are we talking about here? This is, these are not massively complex thing, questions, right? You know? And there's a modesty to that, I think. Yeah, well, I'll, get, I'll continue making my postcards you know, now that I have my stamp box back, you know. And that's so sweet because it's so real in a way, you know, and so modest, you know. Uh, so uh, I don't know why I'm doing, saying that. Well, I mean, this brings to mind, we wanted to talk about one more camera. recent project, uh, a tranquil reminder and also in praise of laziness, both titles that sort of resonate with mm -hmm. the attitude you're describing right now. Mm -hmm. um, most of you probably saw the photo of in praise of laziness in the invitation, email invitation. Um, in front of the Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin, 2009 uh, or 2009. eight. 2009. Uh, it's a rondelle with, well, you have the language more ready. There, you know, there's like a, a circle of, of lawn with carefully cut bushes in certain shapes. And you came in and suggested as your piece to please stop mowing the lawn and let everything grow as it is, except keep the bushes uh, in the shape that they're meant to be. So there's a certain precision, and around it, nature takes its course. Um, well, the, the, the hedge around, the rondelle is in the front of the Hamburger Bahnhof Museum in Berlin. And the rondelle is where, where the uh, coaches uh, would drop, the Hamburger Bahnhof is the museum, Hamburger, you know, uh, in, yeah. Hamburg, Hamburg, Berlin, Hamburg. And uh, that's where they, the coaches and the, where the street, whatever it was, would go in and turn around and drop pass people off. The a former train station? Yes, the former tr uh, train from station. From Hamburg to Berlin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that piece sits in the front of the entry, by, uh, laterally symmetrical to, to an axle to the street when you enter. And, so, uh, the, the hedge around it and these little bulbous four or six hedges are historically registered pieces, mm -hmm. which I find just so good. And, oh, you mean uh, like officially historically yes. registered? Yes, so they have oh, to be maintained. they don't just register as historical No, they, they have stuff. to be maintained as such. Uh, uh -huh. that's, yes, that's the important. Time. Uh -huh. So within that, there was a grass area. So that was where I asked that the, that the, the garden be left to grow freely. Did you call it a garden? Uh, um, I can't remember. That's a good hmm. question. I don't think so. Hmm. I think I said this area. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and did say if, the, if in, however, not to manicure it, you know, let it in perpetuity, you know, go through the seasons. Uh, however, if there were at times people wanted to help nurture it, they could put seeds and, you know, things into it, and, you know, but that would be it. Mm -hmm. you know. And the title comes from uh, uh, Marx's uh, son-in-law who was married to his oldest daughter, Laura. And uh, this idea, he, he was a uh, Cuban-born French physician, but he never practiced medicine. He was very political within the labor communist party for periods of time. And uh, he and Marx had many conversations and, uh, you know, like arguments. Uh, you know, he said that his, his um, Mark, Carl's work in theory is brilliant, but could never be realized in practicality, and he was on the ground in practical this and that. So I borrowed that term. It's a very, very interesting, it's a title of a book, and then it's a lead title, the first essay in the book, and it talks about what would happen after the revolution. 
And there was a problem with three people, physicians, doctors, and politicians, that they had no real skills. And as it goes on about what would we do with them, we'd have to find some work for them. And doctors would probably be, we could, they could use them as butchers, uh, politicians. <laughs> probably, yeah. uh, and and the, I think it was a politician and the uh, religious personnel, he found he was at a loss. They absolutely had virtually no potential skills whatsoever. You know, they're worthless. But, but uh, so I borrowed that title because it also has to do with the kind of... Uh, lyrical brilliance of Marx. We were talking about it earlier, what his mm -hmm. dissertation was. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, the, the life of pleasure and food. And so this misunderstanding of somebody like Karl Marx, you know, he was a, he was a hedonist, especially, particularly, you know. So anyway, I felt it really a rich and kind of ironic title to use for that. Yeah. And, uh, and titles become, um, I'm very interested in them. I mean, I think many people obviously are, but I, you know, the irony in those language of public, a advertising politics and imagery, you know, desire formation that come through that. You know. yeah. Well, we're coming to the end of a, a conversation just because of time, not because of lack of thoughts. Um, I wonder if you could say one more thing, because I didn't want to end on how this piece no, ended. No, no. But I thought maybe you could say one more thing about the third place of learning or another kind of teacher, which for you was surfing at some point early on. Oh, you want so. to bring surfing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, did, I, 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 I was a surfer, yeah. I, I was a complete nerd surfer totally embedded. Uh, uh, and it was a very interesting learning curve for me because it, it but this you have to contextualize temporarily. It was uh, in the, from the very late 50s into the 60s and at that time surfing was a wild card. It had no formal institutionalized bureaucratic structure. And that idea that no one even invited you to it, you, you know, you were asked to do it or you joined a club, nothing, none of that happened. It was more of an idea that you found your way to it and there are many other kinds of things like that. And that idea of finding your way to it and then getting deeply engaged with it is so very different than organized structures. Uh, and, uh, and I got deeply involved in it and um, it, I think it, having to produce it on one's own terms, kind of build a, a structure, uh, seemed to be very valuable for me in relationship to how to approach problem solving. Uh, and it, it, it also, I think, and this is, of course, has to be uh, thoughtful, thought of in, in retrospect. I would never assume to say that I had, this was a pre, you know, prescribed, self-determined thing I knew. But uh, it has, I feel strongly, that it has to do with how one would respond to organized bureaucratic structures uh, from that point on. Uh, this idea of, it, it's, a, it's just another, I don't know how to say it, it's another kind of uh, opening that has to be worked on without all of the prescribed, enforced uh, uh, dictums of organized uh, cultural structure. Right? Mm. And the wave teaches you. Pardon me? The wave teaches yeah, you. Yeah, well, you, you just, you, you take it up. Mm. I mean, it, it's a, and there, I say, there, there, everybody has maybe that experience, that understanding. Uh, it's, uh, I could never understand um, why people didn't understand what was the dark side to organize sports, and, you know, and things like that. This kind of regimentation development, this kind of, you know, folding into the system, this kind of, uh, this is the way you just do things. So my mother would always say to me, this is just the way it's done. Mm -hmm. And that always resonated with me with like, good, so now I know where to start from, <laughs> you know. Some uh -huh. people call it anarchism, but I think it's, there's some, there's, it's, it's something more, it's not so, Dramatic, and, mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. uh, and like when I said about the education, it was really uh, the education. I put, I think education is put in in front of you in order for you to understand where the problem is to solve, and they're certainly not what they're going to teach you. Mm -hmm. And you see, with students, the ones who take the problem up, and the ones who fall into the professional line, you know, 
and they're just hopeless. You know, it's, it's like they might as well go to a, become a banker or something. Bankers aren't bad, but they're not as free as artists. You know, and I really do believe in the free. Yeah. You know, like I told you, the, you know, you free. Uh, if you're a banker and you, you, somebody walks in and they say, I have $10,000, I'll put it in my account. And the banker says, you know, today I have an idea. I think I'll put three in mine and seven in yours. <laughs> you know. I think. But, oh. but we can say that. Mm -hmm. We just have to figure out how to weasel the solution. <laughs> but we can actually put seven in here and three in there. <laughs> and that's an amazing idea. And the other thing we've talked about many times, and what I believe in, is uh, when I would ask myself and people, who is the author of your time? You know? And this is, is that enough? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's never enough, but unfortunately yeah. time is ticking, and I, I, like, I like finishing on this thought. And, I could say uh, one more thing, actually. Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> and that would simply be, vote for Bernie. <laughs> Please vote for Bernie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.